Voice notes of security guards' plans to kidnap Holly Willoughby played in court. Jurors have been played voice notes of a security guard's alleged plans to kidnap, rape and murder television presenter Holly Willoughby. Gavin Plum, 37 years old, allegedly bought a restraint kit online and sent a video, which was also shown in court, of the items, including hand and ankle shackles, a ball gag, rope, metal cable ties and handcuffs, to a potential accomplice. Prosecutors say he had an obsession with the former This Morning host, 43 years old, and planned to kidnap, repeatedly rape and murder her. In voice notes sent to a potential accomplice called Mark, Plum can be heard talking about his alleged plans to attack Willoughby in her own home, using chloroform to subdue her and her husband, the television producer Dan Baldwin, 49 years old. Plan of action basically we're going to hit it at night, less traffic on the road etc, chloroform both of them, that way they can be easily restrained, pick out outfits we like then obviously take her and the outfits with us and then we're gone, he says. Two bottles of chloroform were later found at his home in Harlow, Essex, the court has heard. In another audio clip, Plum is heard saying he wanted to make a video saying she came with us under her own free will and was fully consenting in everything we do to her. Plum was arrested on October 4 last year after he outlined his alleged plans to an undercover US police officer, based in Minnesota, who alerted authorities in the UK, the jury has been told. The court heard he told the officer, who was using the identity David Nelson, he had been planning to kidnap Willoughby for about two and a half years and would slit her throat. On the third day of his trial, the jury was shown more material from a sequence of events, including hundreds of communications he had with others online, as he tried to assemble a crew to help him attack Willoughby and other celebrities. In more voice notes, Plum is heard saying she was the original target but he and others had about 15 cells they were looking at filling. Talking about Willoughby and another potential target, he adds, we could do both at the same time meet up, swap vehicles, get both in the same vehicle, take them to their new location basically. In other messages, Plum talked about buying realistic looking air weapons from pistols to sniper rifles to carry out a home raid to attack her, as well as targeting other celebrities. He also described an abandoned stud farm in the country where he could keep Willoughby, and, in a chat with another man, said the things he would do to her would put me, sick, death row. Plum denies charges of soliciting murder, incitement to kidnap and incitement to rape between December 2021 and October last year. The court has heard he is expected to claim it was all a fantasy. Earlier in the trial, the jury was told Plum has previous convictions for trying to abduct two women on trains and for using a knife to falsely imprison two 16-year-old girls including one whose hands he tied behind her back. The trial continues on Thursday when the undercover officer is due to give evidence by video link from the US. Two gowns worn by Princess Diana expected to fetch huge sums at auction. Two gowns worn by Princess Diana are expected to fetch up to $400,000 each when they go on sale at auction on Thursday. The dresses, worn by the late Princess of Wales during the 1980s, are the most highly valued items in a collection that includes some of her letters, accessories and keepsakes as well as more than 200 items from members of the royal family, going under the hammer in Los Angeles. Julian's Auctions has called it the most extensive collection of Diana's personal belongings to be auctioned since she sold dozens of dresses during a New York charity auction in 1997, shortly before she died. A pair of gowns sold during the New York auction, two months before her death in a car crash in Paris, topped the upcoming sale, titled Princess Diana's Elegance and a Royal Collection, at the peninsula Beverly Hills. Designer Murray Arbeid made the first, a midnight blue tulle strapless gown that Diana wore twice in 1986 to the Phantom of the Opera premiere, to dinner with King Constantine of Greece and to a Royal Opera House performance of Cinderella the following year. It has a top estimate of $400,000, as does a magenta silk and lace off-the-shoulder evening dress designed by Victor Edelstein, which Diana wore in London and Germany in 1987. 
Martin Nolan, co-founder and executive director of Julian's Auctions, said, People will know that name because Victor Edelstein also designed the very famous navy blue dress Diana wore when she danced with John Travolta at the White House in 1985. Diana, he said, was a princess of economics, wearing gowns numerous times not only for environmental reasons but also to use her celebrity status to shine a spotlight on up-and-coming or new or unknown designers, including Edelstein, Caroline Charles, and Catherine Walker, all of whom feature in the auction. One of Walker's creations, a pink floral silk shirt dress Diana wore to a 1988 sports day for Prince William and when Prince Harry left school in 1992, has a top estimate of $200,000. In December a Jacques Asagri design dress worn by Diana in Italy in 1985 became the most expensive dress worn by the royal at auction, selling for more than $1 million. More than 20 of Diana's handwritten letters, notes, and holiday cards are also up for grabs in this week's sale. The keepsakes show the kindness and concern that Diana had and also tells us she was truly happily married, Mr. Nolan said. Many of the letters are to Maud Pendry, a former housekeeper at the Spencer family home at the Althorpe Estate in Northamptonshire, where Diana grew up. Ex-president who protected world's most powerful drug dealers like El Chapo jailed for 45 years. Former Honduran president Juan Orlando Hernandez has been sentenced to 45 years in a U.S. prison over charges he enabled drug traffickers to use his military and national police force to help get tons of cocaine over the border. Hernandez was also fined $8 million by a federal court in Manhattan, New York, following a trial which saw him accused by traffickers of protecting some of the world's most powerful cocaine dealers. The traffickers, who admitted responsibility for dozens of murders, said he protected the likes of Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who is serving a life prison term in the U.S. A jury convicted Hernandez, 55 years old, in March after a two-week trial, which was closely followed in his home country. I am innocent, he said at his sentencing. I was wrongly and unjustly accused. The sentencing judge P. Kevin Kastel called Hernandez a two-faced politician hungry for power, who protected a select group of traffickers. U.S. prosecutors say Hernandez worked with drug traffickers as long ago as 2004, taking millions of dollars in bribes as he rose from rural congressman to president of the National Congress and then to the country's highest office. His brother, Juan Antonio Tony Hernandez, a former Honduran congressman, was sentenced to life in a U.S. prison in 2021 for his own conviction on drug charges. Juan Orlando Hernandez served two terms as the leader of the Central American nation of roughly 10 million people. He was arrested at his home in Tegucigalpa, the Honduran capital, three months after leaving office in 2022 and was extradited to the U.S. in April that year. Hernandez acknowledged in trial testimony that drug money was paid to virtually all political parties in Honduras, but he denied accepting bribes himself. He insisted in a lengthy statement made through an interpreter that his trial was unjust because he was not allowed to include evidence that would have caused the jury to find him not guilty. He said he was being persecuted by politicians and drug traffickers. It's as if I had been thrown into a deep river with my hands bound, he said. Elvis Presley's blue suede shoes expected to fetch up to $151,000 at auction. A pair of Elvis Presley's blue suede shoes are to go up for auction. The American singer wore the size 10.5 footwear on and off stage in the 1950s, including during a performance on the Steve Allen TV show. He acquired the pair after recording the hit Blue Suede Shoes, which was written by fellow singer Carl Perkins, for his debut album in 1956. Presley later gave the shoes away the night before his induction into the U.S. Army in 1958. The footwear is tipped to fetch between $126,000 and $151,000 when it goes under the hammer on Friday at auctioneers Henry Aldridge and Son in Wiltshire. 
the pair has been authenticated by Jimmy Velvet, Presley's close friend of 22 years, who has been described by the auction house as the world's leading Elvis authority. Presley gave the shoes to his close friend Alan Fortas, who later described how he got them in a letter. He wrote, the night before Elvis's army induction in Memphis, Elvis had an all-night party at Graceland. Afterwards we went to the Rainbow Roller Rink. When we all got home Elvis called some of us upstairs and was giving away some of his clothes he didn't think he would be wearing or wanted when he came back from the army. That night Elvis gave me these blue suede shoes size 10.5. I've owned these all these years. Auctioneer Andrew Aldridge described the shoes as iconic as they can be. He added, they are just an exceptional piece of show business, music, and popular culture memorabilia. Bill Gates claims AI will make it easier to combat climate change. Bill Gates has said artificial intelligence AI will accelerate innovation and make it easier to combat climate change, but also warned it must be used by people with good intent. The philanthropist and Microsoft co-founder made the comments during an interview at the Breakthrough Energy Summit in London. Gates told the world with Yalda Hakim that AI had so far played a fairly modest role in helping to combat climate change, but was going to make innovation far easier to do. He said, AI helps us model things in the sciences, understand materials better, and catalysts, and how to make proteins. AI, in every field of endeavor, will be accelerating innovation, whether that's in medicine or helping with tutoring, education. With climate change, some of the complex things like modeling fusion energy, thank goodness AI is going to make that far easier to do. When asked if he was worried about suggestions that such technologies could be used to overthrow governments, Gates said he had not heard that particular scenario. He added that anytime you have a new technology it is mostly used by teachers, doctors and scientists to help them be more effective, but said AI could be used by people engaged in cyber attacks or political interference. So you have to make sure the good guys are staying ahead in detecting and preventing that type of usage. Gates went on to say there was nothing gigantic about AI, adding, misinformation is there, but that's nothing to do with AI. He said we have to anticipate that AI could be used in the making of fake videos, which he said should be marked as inauthentic. Because we know when something's printed on a piece of paper, anybody could have typed it, but we still think of videos as somehow authentic because it used to be hard to fake, he said, as he urged people to ask themselves, where did this come from? There will be laws creating penalties for fooling people, he added. However, he remained optimistic for the future, adding, the biggest thing is going to be advancing medical science, advancing education and taking this climate issue and getting that innovation to move even faster. Pressed on whether AI could be used in cyber attacks on infrastructure such as hospitals, water or electricity, Gates said, the defense has to be smarter than the offense and both sides will use AI to up their game. Asked if he was worried about the future of AI, he said it was a wonderful technology when it's used to help with teaching and health. Gates added, it'll bring changes that will challenge governments to think, how do we step up? And it's at a time where, do people trust government to step in and do those things? How agile will governments be? So this dialogue where governments are starting to pay attention, that's very important. North Korea fires potential hypersonic missile towards sea, South Korea says. South Korea has said North Korea may have launched a hypersonic missile towards the North's east coast. South Korea's Joint Chief of Staff said the launch on Wednesday morning originated from Pyongyang and appeared to fail before landing in the sea. No damage has been reported. Earlier this week, North Korea criticized the deployment of U.S. aircraft carrier, the Theodore Roosevelt, to take part in joint military drills with the South and Japan. It warned of an overwhelming, new demonstration of deterrence as a result. 
South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol boarded the U.S. aircraft carrier, the first sitting president to do so since 1994, and claimed the country's alliance is the world's greatest and can defeat any enemy. Hypersonic weapons are considered the next generation of arms that aim to rob adversaries of reaction time and traditional defeat mechanisms. North Korea has launched various missiles that it claims are hypersonic over the few years. In April, Kim Jong-un watched over a test of what the country said was a new hypersonic intermediate range missile using solid fuel. The missile launch came hours after South Korea said the North floated flying balloons believed to be carrying rubbish across the border for a second day in a row. The balloons caused a three-hour delay at the country's Incheon International Airport after one landed on the tarmac near one of the passenger terminals. Runways have since reopened. Pyongyang has also deployed a large squad of soldiers to build new fortifications within the heavily armed border between the two countries, according to the South's military. Occasional warning shots have been fired from South Korean counterparts.